Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Joining me today is Jo Bregnard. She has taken caregiving probably to the fourth degree. She <laughs> had health issues with herself, some serious issues with her husband and his health, a mom, and now she's doing some elder care for her father. And thankfully for us, she has lots of ideas on self-care, which we know we desperately need. So thanks for joining me, Joe. Sure. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So Joe is in Vermont and I am in California and we are experiencing vastly different types of weather today. <laughs> that is true. It's mud season here in Vermont. So it's cold and rainy and very muddy. <laughs> oh, yes. California forgot what rain is, unfortunately. I think mm. I'm going to have to learn how to take not to start using those rinseless wipes that are suggested for elders. So (laughs) that's right. (laughs) That's an idea. (laughs) And then dry shampoo for my hair. Cause (laughs) I'm afraid that might actually be our reality. Yeah, I know it's terrible. (laughs) It's it's a great state, but uh, we'll have a a serious year of rain. And then we have like five years of like no rain. So Mm -hmm. that'd be very interesting. So why don't you tell us your story, your caregiving journey began with yourself, correct? Yeah, it's funny. I guess I never really think about it that way. But yeah, (laughs) it's the thing that put all the rest of it into perspective, I guess you could say that. Um, I was diagnosed, well, let me say this, my husband had his an issue before I even did. So actually, it did start with him. Um, In 2000, Two. We were married in 2001, and in two, two, 2002, he was injured in a um, a work accident. We both worked for light departments in Massachusetts, and he was a line worker working on a project and was not electrocuted, but was burned very severely. So really scary situation. Um, had to be med flighted to the hospital, um, and they measure burns um, in this certain scale. So it was actually 27% of his body that he had burns on second and third degree. Um, And so, of course, there's the initial shock and all that goes along with that. But then he had follow-up surgeries um, to release skin contractures as the skin heals and scars, it tightens, it restricts movement, it's really uncomfortable. Um, So it was a long process. So toward the end of his whole um, healing, which I was very much a part of because they pretty much send you home, sent me home, I should say, just my my story. Um, we had we did have a nurse come in and, and help take care, but I had to do dressing changes. Um, dressing changes had to happen twice a day, and I had to do at least one a day. And um, you know, I was scared at first, but then it was like, okay, I can I can do this. Like you just step up, right? You do what you have to do. So, so in the kind of in the middle of his stuff. Um, he happened to be home between surgeries and we were walking outside in our garden, our, our poor neglected garden, cause we were so busy doing everything else, um, taking care of him that, and I was talking and I was gesturing to myself. And as I'm talking, I felt a lump in my breast as I'm talking to him using my hands. So I get checked out. Yes, I have breast cancer. So now it's the fall of the same year. Thankfully he's home because he's recuperating. So he gets to take care of me now. Um, as I recuperated, I had a mastectomy and went through chemotherapy. And thankfully, I've been fine since then. Um, I did have um, some uh, tamoxifen therapy after that, but I'm fine. Um, everything was going along great for several years. I just to stick this in here, I did start to get involved in yoga classes, which I really enjoyed. And it was my workout, hot, sweaty power classes sometimes twice a day, like I was just really into it. Um, And then my husband had some really serious heart issues, totally out of the blue, Um, very unexpected, um, really serious. And of course we were dealing with that and you know, everything comes to a screeching halt when there's an emergency. Um, And we thought he was on a trajectory to come back home, you know, serious, had, had his surgery, um, his quadruple bypass surgery. And we thought, okay, everything's fine. He's going to come home. And I get a call in the middle of the night that he was coding and that they couldn't stop him from coding. Um, and now I was, um, we we're in the suburbs of Boston at that time. And he was in a hospital in Boston. So 
they finally did um, get him back and um, maintain him under control. But they said, that's it. You're going to get an implanted defibrillator and pacemaker. We're not going to go through this again. So it took him time to come back from that. Yeah, it was really, it was a lot, you know, like you think you, you know, best laid plans, you have this plan, this is how it's going to go. And I know how everything's going to be. And it never goes that way. So, (laughs) so he came home and I was, you know, um, that's it 24 seven, I got to take care of this person. So, um, people would, you know, say to me, you've got, you know, try to get back to the studio, try to go out for a walk. No, no, no. I got to do, no, I have so much to do. I have things to do. So finally I did my, make my way back. And when I did, it was just like a big sigh of relief, you know, that there's space for me, that there's, there's time and a space for me. And there has to be, because when there's not, I fall apart. Um, and my practice changed a lot after that because I didn't need the racing around. I had enough of that everywhere else. And I, you can get that in other places at the gym or walking or running or whatever. But um, let's see. So it was probably five or six years after that. Again, you know, life goes on. Everything's fine. I always say like, Dude, my life's kind of boring. And then my mom, <laughs> and then my mom um, got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So um, and they're in another state. So we're, again, we were in Massachusetts and they were in Connecticut, my, my mom and my dad. And my dad, thankfully, is very healthy and can handle everything. Um, but, you know, the decline happened. And, um, you know, right around t- uh, 2018, 2019, he was never asking for help. But, you know, we were seeing we were seeing changes in her. Things started to get scary. Then she um, was um, reading stuff on the wall. Like she'd stand in front of a blank wall or a, or a picture and she'd read as if she was reading something. And then she'd get really upset about it. Or she'd look at like a, her thing was like tissues and paper towels and Kleenexes. And she would, you know, stare at them for hours and hours and then be very upset. And like, there's, you can't even take anything away because there's nothing to take away. You know what I mean? So it was mm-hmm. so hard. And, you know, we tried um, for months to get him to get inside help and he really didn't want anybody. and. Um, I was able to go on FMLA. I was still working full time at that point. Um, and that was great. I was traveling down a couple times a week, um, doing what I could do to help. And it was, then it was really getting challenging. It was getting challenging for him. He's 85, 86, trying to help her go to the bathroom and take a shower and stuff. He can't be doing that. And I mean, I could do it, but I can't be there all the time. So we were able to get some help a couple of days a week in. And then the decline just happened fast. So um, we did have her go into a nursing home in 2019. After the years are so crazy. Yeah, 2019. This last because this last year like evaporated. So um, and then she did pass on New Year's Day this this year, 2021, um, with COVID. So oh um, yeah, she did, you know, she did decline. Uh, it was a little confusing. Did she pass from Alzheimer's from COVID? You know, they don't really, I guess, get into the details that much, but um, her situation had gotten much worse anyway. Um, Then it had stayed out of her home for a long time. And then right in December, it, it ran rampant through the home. So, so now my dad is on his own. Um, You know, he, in addition to caring for her, both of us caring for her, there was a thing with him because I saw him being the caregiver, not getting any rest for the whole time that she was in the home. So um, now, you know, I call him twice a day and with COVID, I can only go down every other week because I have to quarantine as I travel back and forth from one state to the next. He's fully vaccinated now. I get my first um, in a couple of weeks. So hopefully we will get there soon. But yeah, it's been a lot. So <laughs> I'm just tired just listening to that whole story. <laughs> it's been a lot. But yeah, I get, and I guess the point is I got to see the caregiving right from both sides. I it was it to me it was much harder to watch somebody else go through something and to struggle with them cuz you can't help you can't solve everything. Whereas if it's it's you um I don't know. I, I felt like I could put it aside. Maybe it's different for other people, but the harder part for me was caring for somebody else. And, you know, in between all of that, I got my yoga certifications 
Um, and everyone thought, oh, well, you know, yoga for cancer will be your specialty, right? You know, I practice without my breast form. I, I teach without my breast form. Um, and I said, no, I think I want to work with caregivers. They're the people that, not that the, the people who have cancer don't need it, but they have a lot of resources. And caregivers, I don't know, people forget about them and it's hard. So I really wanted to, to be there to support that population. Which is fantastic. I find two things especially with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, when you realize my person needs more help, they need me to pay more attention to do more things. It's not that difficult. You know, you, if like my mom, we had a family business together and I would have, she would forget to write details on orders, which was really frustrating. And I would hear her basically chewing the fat with a client and I would basically poke my head in and like, Oh, so what are we doing for Joe today? And, and kind of insert myself into the conversation. That was my hopefully subtle way of making sure that I knew what was going on and kind of connecting with the client so that it just kind of let me like supervise the whole thing mm. without being like supervisory. Right. And it was challenging, especially when, if I, cause we had a photography studio. So if I was in doing portraits and she talked to, I mean, she could talk to a client for an hour while I was doing all that stuff. And, you know, and then I come out and it's like, Oh, what are we doing for this person? And I have to call them. Um, you know, and it just, it got, I didn't realize how stressful it was until my dad announced, I knew our lease was up in 2005, but it was the fall. And he was always battling with the, landlords who you know they were they were typical commercial landlords pay rent shut up and don't ask for anything mm. and so he always had some battle with him which you know life is already complicated enough i didn't think that that was a healthy <laughs> healthy way to proceed through life so we kind of had a rapid escalation of them retiring and i think part of it was because of my mom and he he had chronic health issues so you know you you're taking care of somebody. And the next thing you know, you're up to your neck and holy crap, I, you know, don't, I need help. Or you end up with a medical crisis, either them or you, something happens. And then you like, oh, maybe I should get some help. And it's like, oh, well, now yeah. it's kind of late. Yeah. So yep. I always tell people, you know, when your loved one gets a diagnosis or when you suspect, cause like my mom was mid stage before we actually got an official diagnosis because she was on the denial path. Mm. When you know there's a problem, put a care team together. One for, you know, like, and a lot of people are like, well, you know, my wife doesn't want other people in the house. Well, that's yep. great. You can yep. hire, you know, get your, especially after the, the 2020, you know, you can have groceries delivered mm. and you Good can, point. you know, hire a housekeeper. So what I suggest people do is make a list of, tasks that have to get done every day and set it aside for a day or so add to it as you know, new things come up and maybe, you know, you add to it for a week so that an entire week of basically maintaining your life is jotted down and then look at it and go, what can I outsource grocery shopping? Um, you know, that's not that difficult. You can order them online. They bring them to the door. It's great. Maybe like my dad wasn't a cook. So my sister put together like slow cooker meals that were in the freezer. So it was literally like dump, turn on the slow cooker, you're done, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. And it's also kind of safer because slow cookers don't sure. pose the safety risk of a stove and all those things with Alzheimer's. So I'm always telling people there's ways of getting help mm -hmm. that don't include, you know, it's like you may not want to do all the hands on stuff, but if somebody else is taking care of your yard and you're grocery shopping and you're cooking, then you can do the hands-on stuff right? and ease your person into accepting help. But so many people right. don't ask for help until it's too late. And it makes me insane. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And you know, there's nothing you can do when they, when they don't want to do it either. I, and so I would go down and I would be with my mom while my dad would go to the doctor and do his errands and stuff like that. Um, and you know, they tried to do that with, um, earlier with some neighbors and my mother had this, you know, big pride thing. I don't need a babysitter. And 
it was a it was a bad scene. So um, so this way it, lo- it was more like I was visiting with her, you know. So it was a little different. Um, and then by that time too, she was a, a, bare, a lot less aware than she had been previously. So yeah. So, so your situation perfectly. I'm not sure what the right word is, but it perfectly demonstrates what I'm suggesting is like, have people do all the other stuff on the periphery. Right. Yes. And that way it doesn't look like you're bringing in a babysitter. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause by the time we had to, we had to, like we needed somebody there to, to do that other stuff with her, but yeah, we tried to make it, you know, be as um, non-disruptive as possible, but it's, it's hard and every day's different and you know, all of that stuff. And I got to see, because I was coming from out of state and I stayed over, I got to see a lot of stuff that a lot of other people didn't see, you know, everyone, they would see her at a dinner and they'd say, Oh, she's fine. You know, for a couple of hours sitting next to my dad. And I'd say, we, we go home and I'll go to bed and I can hear her. Cause her thing was um, the schedule, keeping the calendar. And, and she, for, for an hour, she'd say to my dad, what time is Joanne leaving tomorrow? What time am I going? Where are you going to be? What are we going to eat? When are we going to, and then it would stop and then it would start again, you know? So (laughs) yeah, you know, we all have our stories, right? Yeah. Well, and I try to demonstrate and I being not a millennial, I didn't do a lot of like video. Like I watched Instagram stories about, you know, daughters taking care of moms or granddaughters taking care of grandmas and, and man, they record everything. I'm like, my mother would have murdered me like for what oh. little bit I did record. <laughs> but I have some examples of what like advanced Alzheimer's looks like. She would walk behind me. I mean, I must have looked like the biggest jerk. We always went to the park to watch kids. That's what she did. That's what that's what made visiting with her mentally doable for me. Because if I didn't, she would literally ask me every two minutes. So what have you been up to lately? Oh, so what have you yeah. been up to lately? And yeah. it was, I mean, it almost sounded like a parrot. Yeah. And, you know, once you, I, I would always visit on Mondays and this was back in the old days, I would go to the gym and then I'd go home and shower and dress and go to my rotary meeting. And then I would go and visit her. So when she'd ask the question, I would basically, I would answer first, oh, I went to the gym and did X. And then she'd ask me again, oh, well, we, I had our rotary meeting. And then she'd ask me a third time. Well, at Rotary today, so-and-so talked about X. And then the fourth time, well, I went to the gym and then I went to Rotary and now I'm here visiting with you. And then the fifth time, well, you know, I've been busy this morning, but I decided to come and spend the afternoon with you. <laughs> yes. And then it's like, well, now I've run out of things to say. <laughs> right, and I was like, holy right. crap. You know, I've like piece parsed my life into little tidbits and it's still not enough. So we would mm. go to the park, but she would walk behind me like significantly, 20 or 30 feet. And if I slowed down, she would slow down oh. and she'd watch her feet. So she, she was absolutely a hundred percent ambulatory. She didn't have any balance issues, but she would avoid shadows or any place oh. where the sidewalk was like, if you know, the sprinklers had gotten part of it wet, she would try to avoid that. She would try to avoid stepping on her own shadow, which was hysterical, but frustrating because you cannot oh. avoid your own shadow. Try it. Yeah. It's not possible. Yeah. And, you know, it's like that it's not just memory loss, people. You know, like one day I showed up and she she was telling me as we were getting ready to leave, she said, I gotta go to the bathroom. Okay. And they had a like public bathroom in the memory care. And so I would open the door and go, Okay, here you go. And then she'd stare at me like, What am I supposed to do? And here I'm like, Okay, great. We're at that point today. Okay. So then I would escort her in and basically verbally walk her through it. And then literally the next week. She's standing there and I'm like, oh, great. If his, she was fumbling with her clothes, and I'm like, if I help her with her clothes, she's going to scratch me because that oh, was, she got yeah. really combative and would claw people. Uh, and I was like, so I like literally pulled her pants down. And thankfully, and I have kind of crap knees, so I can't like squat all the way down like 20 somethings. And I was just, I was just waiting for it, but she thankfully didn't. And then we left and we went to the park and it was a nice afternoon, but yikes, you know, it's just, yeah. and she was, I laugh now because she would literally take about four feet of toilet paper and accordion fold it and then lock it in her hand. And she had it stuffed everywhere in her purse, in her dresser drawers, you know, 
Not that you mm-hmm. would have used it during the height of the uh, toilet paper shortage last year, <laughs> but I mean, it was clean, but you know, it had been handled. <laughs> I was just like crazy weird. It's like, yeah, why are you, you know, like we were going to the dentist one day and I was desperately trying her to get her to throw away this four feet of folded toilet paper that was just like locked into her fist. And she and I'm like, what's in your hand? She's like, what hand? And she's like looking at the one that this <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, uh, this is like Yeah. You know, and you were talking about you weren't sure if it was COVID or Alzheimer's or the Alzheimer's made the COVID worse or vice versa. When my right. mom passed away and I got her death certificate, I pulled it out because I was like, this thing is going to say this woman died from Alzheimer's because that is what she died from. She fell mm-hmm. and broke her leg. So she technically stopped eating and drinking. So the first line of the cause of death was medical terms. I had to look up on Google (laughs) that basically (laughs) said she died from not eating or drinking as a result of advanced Alzheimer's. I'm like, good. Now I don't got to fight with the County to get this corrected. Cause to me, it's a historical document. Mm, She died of X when she had Alzheimer's for 20 years. I mean, it's like, right. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, they were saying, well, if somebody's hit by a bus and they, but they were marking it down, they died from COVID. I'm like, well, yeah, we're going to make sure her death certificate is correct. Right, right. Yeah. So, yep. what? So, you've used yoga as your self care. How? So, tell me how you share that with caregivers and how it can benefit caregivers. I know personally, I need to do, I need to do slightly uh, more heart pounding workouts and I've mm-hmm. done power yoga. I have to get back into that a little more um, just because it's a stress release. It's like, mm-hmm. if I don't do a workout five, six days a week, I get really nasty. It's not very mm-hmm. nice. <laughs> <laughs> there, we definitely need to move and have um, a cardiovascular workout for sure. Right. So, but what has happened with me is I ended up shifting away from getting that in the yoga studio because I did, couldn't always get there, right? It was easier to just walk or run or something outside. But what ended up happening was because I was, um, how I got specifically here talking to you today <laughs> is because I was driving back and forth so much. I mean, I was so busy t- um, during you know 2019, especially working full time, traveling to, once or twice a week to see my parents and keeping everything you know, and and teaching. And and this business was, you know, just a side thing at that time. Um, Keeping everything going. It was a lot. I always say the caregivers, they have um, their own life and then they have to manage somebody else's life. Because a lot of times when you're caring for somebody else, depending on what their situation is, uh, you're their brain for like their calendar and their finances and everything else. So you're living two lives. This is a lot to manage. One is hard enough. So, yes, um, sure. <laughs> so I was just not taking care of myself. You know, I was, I was, I thought I had it all down because I would get my, you know, Starbucks and I would have my granola bar and I had a whole routine and I would stop and go to the store and pick up whatever they needed and pick up whatever I needed. And, and I had this down and I was so proud of myself. But then I just realized that it was a little bit of a treadmill (laughs) and it was not a healthy situation for me. I had no idea what was going on. Like the the seasons were changing. I didn't know, like, except for, am I turning my headlights on sooner on this drive or, you know, is it raining? That's about it in terms of what I knew what was going on with the weather and everything else. So I was missing out on, on a lot of stuff. And instead of denying myself, I said, I can't, like, you can do that for, a couple of weeks or a couple of months, if you have to, right? There's an emergency in your family, you will do what you need to do. But that is not a long term sustainable way to live at mm-hmm. all. You're going to burn out and then you're going to crash and burn. And then nobody has help because you're not available to do anything. So, you know, what I wanted to do was work with people and say, let's try to find little spaces during your day where you can take a breath where you can close your eyes for a minute and collect your thoughts. Um, Cause I found, you know, with this whole routine that I had driving and everything, um, I would, I'd say, ah, oh, this is great. I'm getting everything done. And then I'd say, oh my gosh, I, I'm so like doing so much that I forgot to do this really basic thing. I forgot to pick up the main thing I went to the store for or whatever it might be because we're scattered, right? We don't, we're not focused or centered. So, um, 
that's what I wanted to do is bring those opportunities to people because you don't need an hour. You don't even need a half hour. If you have the ability to take, you know, one breath. And I mean, like to go behind the bathroom door, because sometimes that's what you need to do, right? For Because you can't leave your person alone. And maybe it's when their back is turned for one second that you could close your eyes and take a mindful breath that you can gather yourself a little bit and to work that into your day. Because that's another thing too. If you try to save up your um, your movement practice or the time that you're really going to focus on yourself for when you can do it, you're lucky if you get it in once a week or so. So why not kind of pepper it throughout your day when you can when you have a moment or two um, and do it that way? And then you know you sometimes because I've been there too. There are days that you don't even have the ability to do that. But I'm trying to find some different things that work for people, things that work for me, and I think they work for other people too. I'm sitting right next to um, my favorite fuzzy blanket here, and it's reminding me about. Um, I, as I was folding the laundry a couple of weeks ago, I hate folding laundry. It's just like, it's in the basket and uh, I, I didn't, cause folding, it means putting it away. And, uh, and um, I, I said, how can I make this a better exercise? I usually empty the dishwasher when I call my dad in the morning and at night, because I, I, that's another task I don't like doing. So I'm distracted. And then, then by the time I hang up with him, it's done. And I, it wasn't like, didn't take anything away from my day. So folding this basket of laundry, I just thought, oh, my favorite fuzzy sweater. Like, I love this fuzzy sweater. It got me through so much this winter. And, you know, I when I just look at it, I say, oh, I'm going to have that kind of day today. You know, sweatpants, my fuzzy sweater. And then I had my husband's jeans and they, you know, the belt loops are all pulled off and there's holes in them, but they're like, they're rough compared to my fuzzy sweater. And it was like, you know, these jeans protect him as he works outside. and you know, every piece of clothing had a story and I had a moment to just think about and be grateful for this clothing that protects us every day. And even an exercise like that can help you because if every task you do for yourself and then as your caregiver is something you're just trying to check off and get off the list, like that's a hard life. For, again, we can do it for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, but that's just a hard way to live long time, long, long term. So these are like the the different little opportunities that we look for. So what I'm offering right now, I have a um, a membership that involves yoga, mindfulness, um, breath work, hand postures. I really like hand postures because they're things that you can do while you're like sitting watching TV with your person or or accompanying them somewhere at the waiting at the doctor's office or things like that. Um, and there are live and recorded movement classes, um, as you might imagine with yoga, but then there are also off the mat classes that are things that you can do anywhere that are little interesting practices that can bring a sense of calm and centering to your day. And then we also have, um, the community as it turned out this past year, I wasn't expecting this, but with everyone being locked in and not being able to do much, they were missing a sense of community. So my members wanted to get together and have, um, we have a book club now, monthly book club. And we also have just a meetup where we just get together and talk on a specific topic. So most of the people I work with, um, I have people taking care of their parents, teachers, right? Our caregivers, we forget about that. Parents, um, there's really all manner of, um, of people all with little different individual situations, but we all have the same thing in common. So yeah, it's nice. Everybody's caregiving journey is different, but there's just a common thread. And I like what you're suggesting where you pepper in little mindfulness or movement practices throughout your day. Cause the mental visualization I got was like, that's like a release valve. Because I know it did not, well, first off, my mom thought I was her best friend, which was totally fine. You know, it's like I had lost a ton of weight. So I had suspected that the person that she remembered wasn't the person that I looked like anymore. So I had sort of an, a little bit more of a gentle easing into knowing that she didn't remember who I was, how our relationship was. Mm. But, you know, being her best friend, that's, uh, can't complain about that one. But she was still so good about pushing that nerve button. Like, mm. I know you wouldn't do this to your friend. Like, why are you doing that? I'm your friend. Like, <laughs> you used to drive me crazy. And so there was still somehow that 
that mother daughter like uh, relationship that just like oh, interesting. Uh, just, you know so when we were at the park and she'd be a little bit weird or say something that just was like baffling it was easy enough to just like put my head back on the bench and look at the trees in the sky and take deep breaths and like listen to like close your eyes and listen to the kids playing and listen to what's going on and it was always relaxing and i'm thinking man i really should have tried some yoga while my mom was watching kids <laughs> <laughs> but you did because you had it off the mat that's your time off the mat cuz we don't always have the ability to have you know specific set aside time off the mat i i always used to say um when i was staying over there that I, i'll do something right before i go to bed I'd be exhausted, right? You know, the the day you're tired at the end of the day, and that's what ends up happening too. Is you're so tired that um, that you're like wound up and can't sleep. That sometimes happens, or you, you're just dropping to bed. Like there's no way that you can do anything. And for the for the first problem where your your body is still, but everything else is churning, we also do um, a yoga nidra practice which is a, a guided meditation for relaxation. Um, it's, it's considered like yogic sleep and it brings you into a state between um, being awake and being asleep, just a really, really relaxed state. And it's a nice way to drift off into sleep if you're having trouble going there. So that's um, a practice that we do once a month as well. So, yeah. So what other off the mat techniques can you describe audibly because we are going to do a little practice that you guys are going to have to catch on YouTube mm -hmm. um, because this is audio <laughs> and <though laughs> Joe and I can see each other just fine through zoom, but what other suggestions? Cause I always, when I'm, if I'm making dinner, emptying the dishwasher, holding clothes, doing chores, I listen to podcasts. So yes. you yes. find other things to do, which I'm going to try because mm -hmm. As soon as I put my earbuds in, because my hair is long enough, my husband will come in and start, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, <laughs> earbuds in. He's like, oh, I can't see them. I'm like, they're white. My hair is not covering my ears completely. It's like, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't had enough outside time in the last year. He's driving me bananas. Mm. Um, but <laughs> you were talking about, in a related note, you were talking about how, you know, we're just kind of like checking off the to-do list constantly. And I have had to step back from that. I am a very organized, very planning kind of person. So 2020 was hell because you couldn't plan practically past today, which was right. really hard for me. And I got into a routine and I've gotten into a routine so I can do all the things that I want. But then I started finding it's like, but I want to do X, but I'm also, I need to do Y. And, and I was starting to like stress myself out trying to do everything that I wanted to do. I'm like, okay, I just need to like chill. Yeah. Like, yeah. No to do list on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I've started doing that too. I've um, started unplugging on Friday nights and going light for the rest of the weekend. Um, I tell my dad, you know, obviously I will look at my phone and make sure that you haven't called or anything. Um, I, I silence it, I don't turn it off. Um, but it's been really nice because just to get away from all the, all the stuff that's really not that important. I mean, you, when I do that, I end up making a little mental priority list. Obviously, if he called, you know, that would be something that I would answer and, and address. But, you know, the other notifications that my favorite book is now available or that, you know, somebody posted on Facebook, like I don't, that's not stuff that I need to respond to right away. So it takes, it takes a load off for sure. Um, but yeah, you know, I think one of the, we'll do a couple, we're going to build a couple right into the, um, the on the map practice as well. But again, I try to find the ones that that you can kind of do in front of other people because sometimes you don't have the ability to get behind a closed door or a quiet moment in the during a day. If you do, take advantage of it. But you know, just something as simple as placing your hand on your heart, and you can put one hand on top of the other hand. And I mean, my eyes automatically want to close when I do that. And if you're in a place where your person's safe and you're safe and you can close your eyes and tune in to what's going on inside because you know you described it perfectly where everything's going on around us and i think as caregivers we become the planner and the appointment maker and and the caretaker and the cleaner and the cooker and and we have all these other labels and we forget like what's who we are like before we came into this whole role and 
that gesture and and especially being able to close my eyes brings me back to that place that's under my hands to you know that little inner spark that's always there and i said oh yeah that's right i'm still in here i'm still in here i've got to do these other things today these other things don't define me um because i i know too that different times during caregiving, we can get really resentful, right? That we have to do all this stuff and our person might not appreciate it um, or they might not even know that we're doing it or other people might not appreciate it because not only are we dealing with the, our person, but everybody else who's got their own feedback about how how well or not well we do our job. Um, so it can be a lot. And I, I find that that brings me back to me something like that brings me back. That sounds lovely. Well, that one of the other things I try to tell caregivers and I mentioned it and I don't know if you caught it. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. And when you start and it's not so hard and you make some adjustments and then, you know, it's been three years, it's been five years and now you're neck deep in all of that stuff that you just mentioned. This is why I tell people they need to learn all of these things, you know, Life is for the living, and yes, you need to take care of them, but you need to take care of yourself or else you will not be any good to yourself when they're gone. Right. Or worse, I think it's 65% of caregivers end up hospitalized or dead before the person they're caring for yeah. because they don't take care of themselves. They put off medical appointments. The stress, the mental and physical stress is so great that their body just says, I'm done. Right. Right. And we, you know, we can't do that to ourselves. I mean, my maternal grandfather always said, you don't get out of this life alive. And I am not suggesting that somebody with Alzheimer's or cancer or heart problems is less than us, but we can't make us less than them. And I see that right. a lot. Yes. Yes. And so, exactly. Yeah. It's, exactly. it's, and it's a really difficult thing to balance. So I'm mm -hmm. like, I like that you said, you know, just put your hand on your heart and breathe. I mean, you can do that while you're sitting on, on the toilet or something, which is a little weird, but it's okay. Whatever you got to <laughs> <It's>, do. <laughs> it's true. It's true. No, my friend Colleen has a great movement exercise while you're sitting on the toilet. I mean, I just, I, again, you find this, this, these pieces of uh, time that you have because some days you just don't have it and go for it. I love that. I, I, like the practices too, that you can do like sitting in a car, you know, uh, at a stoplight where you're not, maybe not closing your eyes or anything, yeah. or in between, you know, you're running an errand because that, that's, you know, I'd be running these errands to go to my parents' house and I'd have, I probably had the opportunity at that time, a minute in the car before I started it to do something, you know? So that's the, those are the types of things that we're looking for. So what, what would you do for that quick minute in the car before you dash to the next shop? So um, if the weather was favorable, I would definitely roll down the window. The, the air, and actually, before you get in the car, I mean, if it's really nice out, if it's like where you live and you can be out in the air, um, being out with sunlight hitting your closed eyelids is, is so good for you. Um, you know, vitamin D aside, just the mental um, reset that that offers is really wonderful. And I mean, I, I think I might, you wouldn't even, I was going to say, put my seat back. You wouldn't need to do that because somebody's going to say, you know, and I don't, I don't know how my seat is organized and I wouldn't want to be able to put it back in the same, in the same place. And I get that. So I wouldn't even put my seat um, back, but I would put the um, window down and I would just close my eyes for just a moment. And we're going to do a, um, a hand posture, um, a, a mudra, a hand gesture um, during our, our practice. And there are so, so many that you can do. And there, there are things that you find that you do with your hands anyway. And one of my favorites is this one. I can show it to you this way. My two hands are together, like, like a prayer, right? My two hands are together. But then if I make some space between them and bring the thumbs together, the length of the thumbs together, and then just rest that in my lap. Like you're, that's a pretty comfortable um, position for your hands. This is um, a hand posture for balance. Mm. And maybe, uh, you know, on that day where you're racing around, your life is way um, weighted too much in the rushing and in the giving end of things. 
And something like this, bringing your hands together like this in your lap. Like even if somebody saw you, they don't, they don't know what you're doing. And you could close your eyes if that felt great. And you could just sit for a moment and think about feeling each of these fingertips touching every other fingertip and how there's equal pressure from one side to the other and rest right in that balance just for a moment. Cause maybe that's the only moment of balance you get in your whole day. Right. But you had that, you had that. It sounds terrific. Yeah. So are we yeah. ready to move on to part two? I think so. Okay. I think well, so. This has yeah. been fantastic. And for those of you who are listening, all of the stuff we're about to do next will be on the YouTube channel because this is not something that she can demonstrate verbally. So we're trying something a little different today. I do have a friend that's really trying to get me to do live stream podcasts. But as I was telling Joe before we started recording, my husband and I are trying to take a three week road trip this summer and I don't want to be tied down to a specific date time to do stuff. So <laughs> Right. Well, that's the beauty of all this online stuff, right? Whether it's your people listening, my people participating in my classes as well. That's the whole point. You can take them in the middle of the night. If you're awake, you can listen to a podcast no matter what you're doing. That's mm -hmm. the beauty. Really wonderful opportunity for us. That's, that's one of the reasons that I started the podcast. A lot of people do know this, but for your benefit, I was searching for ways to connect and have better visits with my mom, because as we were talking about earlier, she'd asked me the same questions until I wanted to pound my head on the wall, which is definitely not good for my brain. And <laughs> no. I am a reader, love to read, but you can only read books on caregiving for, I mean, first off, you're trying to absorb the information. And secondly, it's just, it's a lot, it's heavy. And so it would take weeks to or you know maybe not weeks plural but to a couple two or three weeks to get through one book whereas normally a fiction book i would read it in a week or less and one day i was at the gym back in the old days <laughs> and i had this you know it's called a flathead moment when you smack yourself on the head and go <laughs> duh why didn't i think of that earlier and i because i can't see without glasses i waited till i got home and went on my computer and looked for a podcast for Alzheimer's caregivers. And this was late 2017. And there was one. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it's hard, kind of depends on which way you want to look at it. It was not my cup of tea. And I was listening to one called Side Hustle School. It was literally 10 to 12 minutes, which is exactly how long it took me to get to the gym. And they did a bonus episode on starting your own podcast. So I was like, well, I think I could do that. <laughs> and here we are. We're about, well, your episode will air in season four, which starts in May. Wow. But yeah, and I have a whole crate full of Alzheimer's books and I do read through them and look through them still, but I have learned so much from my guests, even in this last year, since my mom's passed away, I've learned a lot. And I'm like, well, if I'm still learning things, mm. then my listeners are learning things. And so I love to bring the unique, everybody's unique story. Like, obviously I've not talked to somebody who's been through your specific <laughs> challenges which okay. is probably a good thing um i'm sure you don't wish that on too too many no. people and it sounds like everybody's doing okay yes. uh, except for mom but you know right. that's like i said we don't all get out of this life alive you right. know she 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 didn't she didn't die at you know young age so that's good yes and that's true. you know everybody it's i'm always surprised at how people who've gone through this caregiving experience create something new yoga for caregivers, apps, books, podcasts, missing something, but you get the point. Everything, everything. Yeah. yeah, it's true. It's true. And if we can help each other, I, I think um, that's meaningful because I, I think we all have a idea of what it's going to be like, and then we go through it and it's not the way we thought. It, You're like, yeah, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, and who, who else are you going to talk to? Cause a lot of times, you know, um, people who, who aren't familiar with this, they don't understand they, and they don't appreciate all that we have to do. So yeah, it's nice to have, to have that community. Well, terrific. Okay. So this ends the audio podcast. There is a link in the show notes to the YouTube video that we're going to create now, but 
I'm speaking in the future now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real brain twist because I plan things into the future and then somebody will say, They'll ask me a question. I'm like, oh, this week's episode is on X. Oh, no, wait, that's two weeks from now. <laughs> yes, right. Because <laughs> I have to bring myself back to like today. Mm -hmm. And with this pandemic, it's like this week has been a little weird. And so I keep thinking, I thought yesterday was Friday. And I thought today is Friday. No, today is not Friday. Today is Thursday. <laughs> it's been very, a very weird year. I'll be very glad when we can have some normalcy. I'm not going back to the gym. We have a Peloton which they do have yoga classes, which I've done. Great. But I'm looking forward to like rotary meetings outside mm -hmm. where somebody else brings food and not on Zooms. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I think that there again, there's a, a lot of real estate between being on Zoom 100% and the way we were and, and with the weather getting nicer for everybody that that's doable for sure. That is true. Yeah. And I, I just read a really interesting article and I'm going to throw this out there because I think everybody should think about this is the disability community has benefited tremendously from so much of our lives going mm -hmm. online because it's accessible. Whereas a lot of buildings, restaurants, hotels, whatever, are not necessarily accessible and traveling with a, a helper is challenge. You know, it's just, it just erases a lot of their challenges. So I'm hoping like, I know my, Alzheimer's caregiver support group, a lot of people have said, when we go back to in-person, can we also do the streaming? Because sometimes it's just really hard to get out of the house. Yes. Yeah. And well, it would be yeah. Inclement weather. Like there's so many reasons. Yeah. 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 We haven't had inclement weather this year in California. <laughs> Other places, people who who watch or, or participate from far away, right? Or yep. or the, they have a situation in their house where they can't leave. You know, yeah, so. you're just you're just tired because it's been a rough day, but you need to talk to somebody, you know, yeah. it's a great option. I've gotten really in the habit of doing like listening to the rotary meetings and doing stuff on my computer. So it's been <laughs> really, you know, there's some benefit. I don't know if like that multitasking is good for my brain, but, you know, or you can put your earbuds in and wander around the house and fold clothes. Yes. Or yes. walk the dog. I walked the dog during a meeting once. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Or the dog's. Got more than one. So, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, dokie. Well, I appreciate this. You guys definitely check out the YouTube video because you know it's going to be like tons and tons of help for all of us caregivers. Yeah, thank you. You're Thanks welcome. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Yeah, so I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, dokie. <laughs> so, we are back. Hopefully, you've listened to the audio recording of Joe's story and why she has established yoga for caregivers. But right now she's going to walk me through a few different things that busy caregivers can do throughout their day to help relieve stress, kind of balance themselves, center themselves. So I hope you enjoy this. So I'm going to stand up. Pardon me if you end up looking at my belly button. <laughs> okay, take it away, Joe. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, so we're just going to start standing. You don't really need anything fancy for any of this. Um, and while we're going to do it as one practice, there are certainly bits and pieces that I encourage you to take out and do individually. You know, when you're standing in your living room for a few minutes, it doesn't need to be a fancy whole practice. And that's the whole point. So let's just start standing with two feet underneath you and see if you can really, you have your feet comfortable distance apart. See if you can notice the right and left sides of the balls of your feet like the inner and outer sides of your balls of your feet. Yep. And then your heels. I like to think about each foot as a, as a like big triangle. Some people like to consider them as rectangles, but I consider them like two triangles and you're balanced evenly on there. And you might choose to kind of rock backwards and forwards a little bit just to, and side to side, just to get those feet underneath you. It's, right. it's important to feel that, right? To feel the support of your feet underneath you. And then notice how your pelvis stacks over your feet. Yep. And then how your shoulders stack over your pelvis. Again, you might be like shifting a little bit to make this happen. And as soon as we set this up, we're going to take the sculpture all apart. But I want you to feel the sculpture first, right? Feeling strong through the soles of your feet, lifting up through the crown of your head. And even as you do that, you might feel your belly come in toward your spine a little bit and, and help hold you up. And this... Tadasana mountain pose, nice, strong posture. Even if you 
for one moment, for one breath during your day came into an intentional shape of mountain pose. This might help you feel strong and very grounded. But like I said, we're going to mess it up right now. So take your feet a little bit wider apart and just start to shake a little bit. Start to shake out your hands, bounce out your knees. So stress and tension can build up during the day, right? Yeah, you want to dance a little bit, you dance a little bit. All this tension builds up during the day. And sometimes we're so busy standing in, I'm going to, you know, like a, a metaphor, standing in mountain pose and holding it all together and holding all the appointments together and all the caregiving stuff together that it gets, it gets tense inside there. So this is an opportunity for you to really shake it out, shake out one foot, shake out the other foot, anything that might feel good to you. And this kind of shaking off the ends of your hands. I like to think about like flicking. There's something still stuck to you, flicking it off the ends of your fingers. You know, that, that um, thing that you needed to do or that person that really frustrated you. Yeah, just throw it out, right? All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever movement feels like it's right for you. We're gonna, I'm going to give you a few to choose from here. So this is, a, this is a really good one. Another one I like is this. Dusting it off. You know, you got stuff on you and it's and it's sticking to you and you just want it off. You've got a big responsibility on your shoulder. Ugh. You just want to get that off. Get the stuff off your back, right? I'm tired of this person being on my back today about how I did or didn't do something. I made a phone call and it didn't go the way I wanted to. Just brush it all off. And even this movement is something that you can do when the thing happens to get that energy pushed off of you. All right. Yeah, right. Why not? So feet may be a little wider. This is going to be up to you. So come and get grounded once again, because you can do the brushing off and the shaking off for as long as it feels good, but then try to come back to a centered place. So you can actually have in your life the two situations, right, where you've shaken it off and there's movement and then there's a time for stillness. So allow there to be space for both. So with feet maybe a little bit wider here, just start to rotate your shoulder side to side and allow your arms to hang comfortably and your hands to hang comfortably. So start here and gradually allow the movement, the twisting to become a little bit bigger. So allow your shoulders to travel around. Maybe your hands or arms come out a little wider. You might notice as you do this that maybe your hips start getting involved and they start turning. And then, boy, it really feels like it, you might want to go a little bit deeper. So maybe you come on to like the ball of the opposite foot and just allow your hands and arms to contact your body as you turn from side to side. They're knocking into the places where your internal organs are. This is really good to kind of move the energy in your um, internal spaces here. You can keep your arms down low, thinking about your digestive organs. It's important to digest our experiences um, and our situations as we move through the day and not let them get stuck anywhere. So this can help facilitate some of that. You can even take your arms up a little higher and gently tap in front of one shoulder and then the other. This is nice to get um, your breath moving, one lung and then the other, one side of the lungs and then the other. And then as much, you can go like really fast um, if that feels good for you. you um, that might be more natural for you than as slow as I'm going. I like to move slow. But no matter what you did, slow it down and take out one piece at a time, just as we added one piece at a time, right? So maybe now your feet stay grounded instead of coming up on the ball of one foot and then the other, but you're still turning side to side. Maybe your hips are still moving, but then your hips start to stay centered and it's just your shoulder side to side and your head travels side to side as well. And then eventually you allow your arms to just come and rest at your sides for a moment and allow that sensation to be absorbed. You can bring your feet back underneath you here, maybe a couple of shoulder rolls. Just kind of waking everything up here. All right, so one more thing before we come down to a seat here. Um, let's inhale, both arms come up. 
On your exhale, drop your right arm down and arch over to the right side here. So feeling the whole sole of the left foot grounding down, feel the space you're creating between the um, top of the pelvis on the left side and the rib cage here. Uh, filling all that space with breath right underneath where my hand would be. You can bring your hand there. Yep. Inhale, stay with me here. Inhale and reach more toward like a diagonal here over to the right. And exhale and soften that top arm. So every inhale, reach more. Every exhale, soften to your degree. Last time, inhale, reach more. And then for your softening, go ahead. You can even rest the palm of the hand on your head and let your head hang down to the side. Really feeling the whole side body lengthening all the way on the left side. Next inhale, reach up. Both arms come up to center. Exhale, let's take it over to the other side. So opposite arm drops down. The space you feel is between the top of the hip and the lowest rib on the right side here. So, well, you know, allow your shoulder to kind of stay in place, but most of the space you're creating is here. So again, every inhale, reach on a diagonal, create more space here. Every exhale, a little bit of softening. It's like your shoulder comes back into place. This, this becomes integrated. Inhale, reach. Maybe your hand is on your side body, finding that space. Exhale, soften. Last time, inhale, reach for the diagonal. Soften here, really bend the elbow, allow the hand to just rest at the back of the head somewhere, and then find any extra softness that you can, you can muster, maybe in your neck. So a little bit of rest here. Inhale, come back up through center, both arms. And on your exhale, allow your hands to travel down and match your whole exhale. So take the um, whole exhale to float your arms down. Might move slower or faster than me. It's all on your breath. Nice. Yeah, and the spontaneous shoulder roll might just erupt in there. Just let those out. Those are great. So we're going to come down to a seat next. Um, I'm going to show you the way that I like to do it. You can, some people say, oh, you know, I have trouble transitioning from standing to seated or from, um, I'm going to show you too when we go to get up. I don't really, you know, I don't know how to do that comfortably. I'll show you a way that I like to do it. You can do it any way that you like. I have two block towers set up here. So I have a block on its lowest height and one on its highest height. You can use a table. You can use a chair. You can use a desk, a countertop, like whatever you have handy. But we'll, let's do a little bit of breath to movement, and then I'll show you how I make this transition. I have, um, I have a chair that I'm going to use, too, for, um, for our next posture, so, or our final posture, so you can use something like that as well. So near your support, I'm going to face this direction here. Let's just do a little bit more breath to movement, because I find that really relaxing and integrating as well. So inhale, sweep your arms up. Take the whole inhale to sweep your arms up. And then exhale, bring your arms down, just like we did a moment ago. So again, taking the whole inhale to move the arms up and the whole exhale to move them down. And you might think about as you inhale, um, maybe the sun coming out as you inhale. And as you exhale, maybe thinking about the sun setting. So the beginning of your day and the end of your day. Let's take one more. Inhale, sweep up. This time on your exhale, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bend my knees and sink my hips and take my hands down in front of my body. And I'm going to place my hands onto my support here. So I'm like in a little, like I've sat back in a chair with my knees bent and I have my support. So what I like to do is step back with any leg. It's uh, um, recommended maybe your stronger leg and then place that knee down and untuck the toes. And then you can even walk, if you're using blocks, you can walk your blocks back or come right down onto your hands for table. So you kind of did it a little at a time and that's a little more accessible for some people. So let's come down onto a seat. This is another time where some people say, well, I'm not comfortable sitting on the floor. You can certainly do this 
um, seated in a chair. Um, nobody ever said you had to be able to do certain things for yoga for real. <laughs> you don't need to be able to get on the floor. I like to sit on the corner of a blanket when I'm seated on the floor. And I'll tell you why that just uh, um, elevates my hips enough so that my um, pelvis feels neutral where it's, it is in relation to my spine. Um, everything feels comfortable when I sit here. And I can choose to place something, blocks, blankets, something under my knees if I want. But you can do anything that you want with your legs here, as long as your spine and pelvis are speaking nicely to each other and they're not arguing with each other. If, you're, um, if you come down to a seat and you're uncomfortable, you know, your breath, if, usually that means you're crouched like this, your breath will be um, uncomfortable and you, you're going to be looking for a way to get out of it, right? So we want this to be a place where you're, you feel supported. And that's why I said, if sitting in a chair is better for you, then that's exactly what you should do. So when you find a seat that's best for you, think about sitting up tall, like you did when you were standing with your shoulders over your hips. See if you can make that happen here too. In um, the West, especially, we like to, um, what's next? And we like to lean forward and say, what's next? What do I do now? What do I have to work on next? Bring your shoulders over your pelvis. The only place you need to be is right here. You don't need to race anywhere. If you are able to take this time out for yourself in, in your day, allow yourself to arrive on your sit bones right here. So we're starting to kind of slow things down a little bit. And that's kind of what I wanted to do with this practice is get the tension out so that you could relax enough to come down a little bit. So bring your hands in front of your heart, palm to palm, kind of the universal gesture of compassion or gratitude. And you can bring your thumbs right up against your sternum here. Feel them right, right against your body here. Your thumbs are going to stay right where they are. And notice how your chin is in line with your hands. Everything's in a line here. So we're going to keep that alignment even as we move. Find an inhale here. Fill up. Feel the crown of your head reaching up toward the sky. And on your exhale, start to rotate over to the right. And as you do that, keep your chin in line with your hands. So your chin and fingertips are right, your chin is right over your fingertips. So here's a little something you can do. We're gonna stay rotating to the right here. So every inhale, come back to the right. I can't sit that way. Yeah, do we need to change your seat? Do we need to change your seat a little bit, Jennifer? No, nope, but I'm good now. I just. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. I, I shifted and that wasn't working. <laughs> yeah, and because if it's not comfortable, you want it to work, right? So, okay, good. So we're just going to rotate in and out of this side rotation or move in and out of the side rotation, staying to the right here. So every inhale, come back to center and every exhale, come over to the right. So let's take one more together. Inhale on your breath. You might be moving faster or slower than me. Exhale, rotate over to the right. Now stay with me. Now, can you continue your gaze over your right shoulder? Maybe your head turns more. Maybe it doesn't. And on your breath this time, just rotate your head from center back over your right shoulder. Just to release any tension in the neck, any extra stuff that's in your neck. And like I said, you might not have the ability for, for you today to um, look any further over your neck, and that's okay, over your shoulder. That's okay. Next inhale, let's come back to center, a reframe. If you want to reach, change the cross of your legs or adjust something, anytime you come back to center, it's a nice time to do that. Okay. Hands back together. You sure you're comfortable? Yep. Okay. Inhale, tall spine. And then exhale, rotation to the left. And if you move slowly, you can make sure that your chin stayed right in line with your fingertips. So we're inhaling and coming back to center and exhaling and taking a rotation. So notice how the movement is happening from above your belly button. Your hips are staying right where they are. Um, freeing up the space from your waist up, waist up to your shoulders. And it's not about how far you can turn or anything like that. 
And the last time to the left, pause here. And now let's just take the neck turning over the left shoulder a little bit. This is this side doesn't feel as good for me, so I don't turn as far with my head here. Inhaling, coming back over our fingertips and exhaling <laughs> toward the shoulder. I knew I was going to have a disruption. Ah, uh, we always have distractions. Inhale, come on back. It's great when um, when the pets come in. That's why I don't shut my door all the way, and that's fine. It's important when um, your animals come in to say hello that you that you say hello to them. I think that that's that that's fine. There's they know um, they can pick up on our moods as well, right? So mm -hmm. welcome them in the room for sure. This is Remy. Hi, Remy. Okay, you, don't, you don't like okay? You're gonna have to lay down. No, no kisses right now. Okay. So we've got one more thing while we're seated here. And you can adjust your legs in any way that's comfortable for you. And again, you can sit up in a chair. If you're more comfortable sitting in a chair, go ahead and do that. So I just wanted to show you a hand posture that, again, can be done anywhere on its own here. So we'll start with two thumbs up, like you're giving two thumbs up. Go ahead and rest those thumbs up on your lap. <laughs> you sit. <laughs> Thank you. Stay. There you go. Oop, now he's going to leave me. Okay. Oh, my <laughs> <life>. Got it. <laughs> and then turn the thumbs toward each other. Yeah. And that's it. So like the, the heels of your um, hand and your knuckles are resting on your lap here. And see if you can still maintain a tall, comfortable spine and the crown of your head reaching up. And if it feels comfortable for you to close your eyes or to let your gaze go a little fuzzy here, you can do that. This hand posture or mudra is the gesture of the base of the spine. And this is all about centering and grounding and coming back into your body. And on those days when you're feeling really scattered, Maybe you've had some thumbs up things happen. Maybe you've had a lot of thumbs down things happen. This is the gesture where the thumbs are just, they're just hanging out. They're just hanging out facing each other. And that's exactly where they need to be. There's no um, feeling or anything associated with the, uh, the thumbs up or the thumbs down because they're in this neutral position. But see if you might notice that your breath slows down from this, from the shape of your hands and allow the energy to move down your spine, like into where your sit bones are and your pelvis, the center of your, um, your security and your safety, that everything's going to be okay, no matter what else is going on around you. Your breath might have spontaneously just slowed down on its own, or maybe you notice no change at all. Again, these hand postures are things that you can do really anytime. This happens to be one that is not that complex. So um, it's relatively comfortable for most people to hold a shape, something like this. So allow yourself to just become familiar with this because it's something that you can pull out of your back pocket anytime that you maybe need to uh, alleviate the, the scatteredness in your, in your mind and in your day. All right. Be, uh, yeah, you might end up sighing or yawning or settling in. And we could stay here for a while, but. We're going to move on a little bit here because I want to get you into an actual shape for a little bit. So go ahead and release your hands. When you release a mudra, you, you know, do what feels most comfortable for your hands. Maybe your palms are up or maybe their palm, your palms are down on your, on your legs. And kind of let that just sit for a moment as your fingers release. And I'm going to show you my, probably my favorite Oh, I was going to show you my favorite restorative posture, but I want to show you one more movement before 
we get there. One more spinal movement. So we're going to come down onto our backs on the mat. Now you can um, pad your mat with a blanket um, or not, anything that feels good. Doing this on a bed, it's um, a little challenging because um, a bed is squishy. So it doesn't give you um, the feedback that we're kind of looking for. And I'm actually going to move these blocks out of the way so you can see what's going to go on with my arms. So come on down onto your back. And you could choose to, if, if you really need something underneath your head, you could put a blanket or something, um, gently folded blanket, softly folded blanket underneath your head. Um, but it's good if you can just have no props underneath you, because we're going to be talking about the curves of your spine here. So as you're down, um, knees bent, soles of the feet down, and have your feet be a comfortable distance. Before you do anything, see if you can notice the weight of your pelvis, the heaviness here, where it's grounding on the earth here. See if you notice the lift at your low back. There's a little curve here. See how I can make this very obvious. Well, that probably didn't help, but there's a little space here, right? My hand is sticking out here at your low back where it lifts up. Your shoulder blades are grounded down, and there's a lift at your neck, the cervical curve. So see if you can picture or imagine or notice all of these curves of your spine here. Mm -hmm. And at this point, your pelvis is in a relatively neutral um, position, especially since this curve is available at your back here. So on your next inhale, allow your pelvis to tilt forward more toward your knees. And as you do that, you'll increase this space at your low back. You'll make a bigger space at your low back. And then on your exhale, tilt your pelvis back toward the mat and flatten out that place. So take away the curve at your low back. Does that make sense, Jennifer? Yes. Great. So every inhale, take the whole inhale to tilt your pelvis forward, find the space at your low back. And every exhale, tilt back, take the space away. I'm going to come up. You keep going. One more time. Inhale, tilt the pelvis forward, increase the space. And every exhale, come on back. That looks wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So stay where you are. Come back to neutral. I just want to add one more thing here. Since you have that piece, we're going to keep that same movement. And this time, just add the arms as well. So on your inhale, it would look like this as you tilt the pelvis forward and increase the space at your low back. Allow your arms to float up over your head. They don't have to hit the floor or anything. They can even be straight up to the sky and then every exhale as you flatten out, allow your arms to float down. So this is a big movement for the arms on this breath, right? And your, the arms might have to move fast. So they don't need to make the whole distance. Inhale, reach up. And exhale as you flatten out, bring the arms down. And as I exhale and bring the arms down, I just feel like everything settles. All the craziness around me settles when I exhale. We'll take one more time. Inhale, tilting the pelvis forward, increasing the space at your low back. Arms come up to your degree. And then exhale. Give everything permission to just quiet down and settle. And then that was our last one. So let's have the um, spine come back to that neutral place. So that little bit of curve comes back to the low back. Great. All right. So we did some nice work, um, believe it or not, because it wasn't focused on this, with your neck and shoulders and upper spine. And we want to maintain that and not have tension creep back in. So roll over onto one side. And I'm not going to do this. I don't want to knock my earpiece out. But you could have your arm long and your head resting on your arm as you're on your side. And then really use your hands 
to press yourself up. You know, don't use the muscles in your neck and your head to come up. Um, that will bring tension back into those places. So use your arms. Your arms can support you here. We're going to come back to a seat just for one more quick thing. And again, maybe you're going to sit on a corner of a blanket or you can even, I have a cushion that could be a cushion from your, um, from your couch or you could be sitting in a chair. And I wanted to give you another little exercise that you can do at any time as part of a practice or separate. Another thing that I'm, um, I really like to take advantage of are acupressure points um, in our yin practice, which is a floor-based yoga practice that's very quiet and still. Um, it's connected, the postures are connected to the meridians of the body from traditional Chinese medicine. And so instead of, it's lovely to come into a shape we can't always do that, drop on the floor during the middle of a, a caregiving session. So sometimes it's nice to know where some of the acupressure points are that might help us have um, a similar result coming out of our body. It's relaxation, for example. So for this one, um, this point is the place just between your eyebrows, just above your eyebrows, kind of where the indentation is. I like using my longest finger to, to press this point. And you don't have to drill your finger into your brain. <laughs> you want to just um, have enough tone in that finger. Um, it's been said as if you're playing a musical instrument. So imagine I, I, we had our piano tune today. Imagine that you're playing a note on a piano. So you're not, you know, jamming your finger in there. And as you're, the crown of your head reaches up and you're pressing this place, Maybe your eyes close or again, maybe your gaze grows soft or the shades of your eyes might come down and your gaze might be low on the floor here. This point um, that's right in uh, the central vessel um, of our body, right through the center line of our body, right just above our nose, you might think of this point as something that allows you to collect all your thoughts, all the scattered thoughts of all the things you have to do today, all the places you need to be, the appointments you need to make, all the stuff you need to pick up at the store. Think about collecting all those thoughts and organizing them. Don't go through the process of actually making your schedule or anything, but allow the sensation of your finger at this point to welcome a sense of um, calm, focused organization and ease for your day. This is a nice point to, um, to do in the middle of the day to like rejuvenate you. It's, it's great anytime. So certainly the beginning of the day, maybe if you have a busy day ahead, but if you need a little button to push to reset anything during the day, this is a good button to push right here. All right, so gently release that. And you can even, because for a moment after you release it, I, you know, I can still feel my finger press there. You can even bring your attention to that point. If you're busy with two hands, for example, say washing dishes or preparing a meal, and you just need to focus for a moment, you can imagine your attention going to that place. All right, now I can show you the posture. So I'm going to show you two different ways. Um, you can do this against a wall, an empty wall, or um, if you have a door that you know nobody's going to come through on the other side, that might work. And then I'll show you variation, same thing, but with a chair. So the, when people see this posture, they say, oh, that looks so nice. I have no idea how you get into it. Well, the, I'm going to show you how you get into it. So if you have a blank wall, the way that I like to do this is to come right up against the wall. It's easier to adjust yourself the closer you are. It's easier to press yourself away when you get into it. And I'll show you what I mean. So from here, I have, um, I have my right side up against this wall, but it doesn't matter. Go ahead and lean back and lean onto the opposite side so you can bring your legs up the wall and turn and then face the wall. So it's a little bit of using your head and your shoulders to get underneath you. So I'll talk a little bit here and then I'll show you the chair variation. 
Okay. And this dog. is <laughs> dog's got to get all the way for this one, right? Yeah, so it's yeah, up to like you. <laughs> it's up to you how um, how close you want to be in terms of your heels or your whole legs. Usually, your whole legs. That's probably a little much. A little bit of flexion in the knees is best. So I'm going to come out and I'll show you the chair variation. Oh. I'm going to come out the way it came in. <laughs> Rolling onto my side. Well, right in the middle of the mat, that dog is. That's what they do, right? <laughs> oh, you are my funny workout partner. <laughs> they know. They know all the tricks. So with a chair, there he goes. <laughs> Dad was helping with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Food works, right? <laughs> With a chair, it's the same thing. So I'm right next to this chair. You could do the same thing with a couch or, again, a, a low table, like a coffee table. And as I come onto my opposite side, I'm going to bring my legs up onto the chair. And the thing with a chair is you have a, a little more, uh, um, it's a little easier for you to get closer or further away um, as whatever is comfortable for you here. I'm going to come up and see how you're doing. We're going to do the chair. The chair is a great option. There you go. And, you know, you could really be a stickler for, you know, exactly where your hips are in relation to your knees. I don't find that it matters. You know, we all have such different heights of chairs in <laughs> our houses. You know, you just do the best you can. Some days you might feel better um, with your thighs a little more perpendicular and some days not. So it will be totally up to you. Yeah, that's a perfect um, is, yeah. face. <laughs> perfect. Yes, exactly. And this is a place, this legs up the wall, legs up the chair. You know, it's an opportunity to let all the tension drain away from your lower body. As caregivers, we're on our feet a lot um, for long stretches of time. So this gives you the opportunity to let any tension or stress drain away from your legs. And animals always come around when this posture is happening. They know they can pick up on when you're relaxed um, and they want to relax too. So for sure, it's a good time for scratches and snuggles. <laughs> And if you don't happen to have a dog or a cat who's coming in and bothering you at this time, it's if it's a real quiet time for you, um, an, if you have an eye pillow, it's a nice opportunity to pull that out. If not, a folded um, hand towel is nice over your eyes. The gentle pressure of something like that on your closed eyelids encourages your eyes to relax even more. Um, and that can be really rejuvenating if, you, you know, if you'd love to take a nap, but you just don't have time in the middle of your day, five or 10 minutes of this shape can really re-energize, um, re-energize you physically and kind of reset you mentally as well. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to... I'm going to let you rest here. So you could stay here as long as you wanted. Your arms alongside you, palms up or down. We might have pulled a blanket over you or at least over your feet and lower legs. Um, and yeah, you know, you might just find yourself if you really need a nap, you might just find yourself falling asleep here. But it's a nice, nice time to be with your pets if they come, if they come around. <laughs> You're blocking the whole camera. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's perfect. There, everybody oh. can relax now. Everybody can relax now. So yeah. whatever your, your caregiving duties are, know that you have time for yourself and to make time for yourself like this, even if it's just for one mindful breath during the day can make a difference for the person that you're caring for too. So it's important, not just for yourself, but for everybody you come in contact with. That way you don't explode at people. Exactly. Exactly.
So you could, again, you could stay here as long as you'd like. I'm not going to do a formal Shavasana or final posture with you, but this is a good posture too. If you want to change it up, you could like move the chair, kick the chair out of the way and come fully onto, um, onto your mat or onto that surface and just relax for a few moments before stepping back to your day. Like I said, things get a little loosey when you're trying to, um, trying to squeeze in a practice in between things. So it doesn't have to look as formal as a regular class. Well, this is, and that's it. Yeah. I'm glad that you joined me. Yeah. Both of you. (laughs) <laughs> yep, and to sit up, same thing. You can roll over to your onto your side if that works. If you don't have a dog in the way, <laughs> <laughs> and use your hand to press up, and that's it. And he leaves me. <laughs> this has been fantastic. I really appreciate the the podcast and the video cast. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been fun for me too. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.